We're all familiar with this scenario. A company has trouble keeping up with its competitors and looks for ways to cut costs in a bid to boost its sagging profits. In industry after industry, the result is the same, a downward spiral in wages, health plans, and retirement benefits. Some have called it the Walmartization of the economy. But does it have to be this way? Do companies really have no other options? I'm Sarah Bartlett, and this is our topic today on USA Inc. Joining me today is Eileen Applebaum, professor of management at Rutgers University, who recently co-authored a book called Low Wage America. Eileen, thanks for being with us today. My pleasure. There's a phrase that's starting to seep into the vernacular, the Walmartization of the economy. Can you tell us what that means to you and what's happening to the labor market? Sure. Well, you know, for decades uh, in this country, we've had the belief that if the economic pie is growing, if productivity is going up, then the slice that goes to uh, employers in the form of profit should rise, but also the slice that goes to workers in the form of wages should be getting bigger. And uh, the company that was held up as a model and that other companies tried to emulate was General Motors, which would negotiate with its uh, employees, with its union, uh, about wages, about productivity, about uh, compensation, benefits, and so on. And uh, as a result of this, as a result of taking General Motors as the model, what we had for decades was a situation in which whenever productivity rose, so did the wages of American workers. And this was the era in which we had this huge, huge expansion of the middle class, uh, in which uh, my parents, uh, for example, you know, went from uh, being uh, really just barely able to make ends meet to owning a house in a nice neighborhood and, uh, and, and feeling like they were the part of the dream. American dream. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Uh, and that has changed now. That has changed now. And uh, what's happened is that uh, Walmart has become the largest employer in America. And Walmart is the company that uh, Wall Street now holds up as an example. Uh, and Walmart prides itself on not having a union and on not paying very much in benefits and on not being a high-wage employer. It, its motto is everyday low prices, and it acts as if the only way you can have good uh, service, low prices, what, what consumers want, is if you pay low wages. Well, theoretically, a business is healthier if it can keep its costs low and keep its profits high and reward its shareholders with ever-increasing dividends. That's and right. This is, remain this competitive. Why wouldn't you as an employee want to work for a company that's very competitive? Well, there are a couple of problems. I mean, this, what you say is exactly right. You, you want a company whose labor costs are low, whose profit is high, who gives the consumer what they want, and uh, therefore, you know, is, a, is a, a good company. But many people make the mistake of thinking that low wages equals low uh, labor costs and that low wages equals high profit. Can you explain this, that? Yes. Uh, people think that all you have to do is look at the wage that you're paying, but it turns out that your labor costs consist of a lot more than just the wages. So if you have a company that has, for example, high turnover, so that it has high costs of recruiting, screening, hiring workers. It always has lots of workers who are new to the job because of this high turnover. People are not experienced. They're not experienced workers. They don't know the merchandise. They can't really help the consumer uh, buy what they want. You find that uh, sales are not as high as they could be. Uh, and you find the profit is not as high as it could be. So there is another model. There then is definitely for another being a model for being a successful. And uh, and in this other model, your labor costs may be low, even if your wages are high. If your productivity is high, if you if your uh, sales revenue is high, you can pay high wages and nevertheless have low labor costs. Uh, we have we have really a good example. Um, you might have heard of Costco. Mm -hmm. Costco competes head-on with Sam's, and Sam's Club is a Walmart operation. Uh, and uh, recently, uh, researchers have taken a look at this, and what they've seen is 
Let's just compare wages. So the average wage of a full-time worker at Sam's Club is eleven fifty an hour. The average wage of a full-time worker at Costco is around sixteen dollars an hour. Huge difference. If you look at health benefits, 82% of uh, workers at Costco, compared with just 47% at Walmart, have health benefits. And the company's contribution to those health benefits is much higher at, at Costco. Costco. If you look at, at, uh, at uh, pensions, 91% of workers at Costco, compared with 64% at Sam's Club, have pensions. So on all of these scores, you might think that Costco had the higher labor costs, but if you look at Costco's labor costs as a percentage of its sales revenue, Costco's labor costs as a percentage of sales revenue are 10% of sales revenue compared to 17% uh, for Walmart. Well, let's stop and think about what that means. That yes. means that they're spending less at Costco. Out of every sales dollar, they spend less on labor costs than, than Walmart, that Sam's Club of Walmart mm -hmm. spends out of its dollars of sales revenue. So that the savings then drop to the bottom line for Costco. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so. And, and you might ask, how is this possible? <laughs> and of course, the answer is that Costco, because it has good wages and benefits, has turnover that is, just, is, that is less than a third of the turnover at Sam's Club. So, so they're not losing employees to that's competitors. Right, that's right. They're not having to, to retrain. That's exactly right. And it's huge at Sam's Club. They have annual turnover of 21%. So that means a fifth of your workers are new every year. Uh, they don't know the merchandise as well. They can't figure out if a customer asks for something, you know, what else they might suggest that that customer want, might want to buy. And uh, so sales revenue uh, per uh, employee is lower and profit per employee is lower. At Costco, per profit per employee is about 13600 and at Sam's Club, it's about $11,000 a year. So if I'm a manager and I like the idea of being able to pay my workers more than someone else um, because it keeps a, a loyal workforce, why wouldn't everyone do this? Why isn't this kind this of an is obvious a, this thing? This is a really good question because, you know, uh, academic researchers like myself, and I'm not the only one, the many of us who have written about this virtuous circle, uh, not only in retail but also in manufacturing and uh, why this pays off for companies. Uh, and I naively thought that we would just show them how it pays off and, <laughs> as you all said, adopt they that all strategy. adopt it. But it turns out that, uh, that uh, faced with competitive pressures, a lot of managers, a lot of employers think to themselves, well, the easy thing to do is to freeze wages, reduce benefits, reduce staff, increase workloads, and that's how I'm going to compete. Uh, the alternative is train your workers, reorganize your work process, give them flexible schedules, do the kinds of things that are going to allow you to retain your workforce, and get your productivity up, get your sales revenue up. I wonder, you know, how many MBAs does it take? <laughs> how many degrees do we have to have from Wharton, you know, before we're, so before that people can say, freeze your, you know, freeze your wages, cut your benefits? I mean, do you have to go to school to learn that? Well, are there other examples besides Costco, or there is it many, very unique? No, there are, there are many examples. Uh, in apparel, I just recently visited a, a company out in Los Angeles called American Apparel. And you know, this country is hemorrhaging apparel jobs. Sewing machine operators are going out of you know, existence in this country. Uh, but uh, this, kind of, this company is just growing by leaps and bounds. And they've opened a couple of stores right here, retail outlets right here in, uh, in Manhattan. Hmm. Uh, and they pay, those, the, those sewing machine operators make an average of $12 an hour. They can have health benefits for their entire family at a cost of $8 a month. Uh, you know, the company, and they, they, have, they have no turnover. They have a waiting list of people who want to work there. Everybody who works there has a friend on the waiting list who would also like to work there. Uh, and this company, uh, you know, manages to be a good employer, manages to be competitive because it thinks about its market. It thinks about what can we, what are the styles that people want to buy? How shall we design our clothes so they are going to be attractive? Uh, and they use modern, uh, modern uh, management techniques. These are not your old-fashioned sewing machine operators sitting there all day sewing collars. That, that's what my mother-in-law did when she first arrived, and she spent decades, you know, just sitting at a sewing machine sewing collars. No, this is team sewing. They sit in a circle, they sew an entire garment, 
you know, everyone it's a can. Different it's way just of a doing whole different way of doing, doing things, the and they're they're way more productive. Labor costs are lower. You can pay your workers more. You can give them health benefits and still be competitive. And open four stores in Manhattan in the last couple of years. Does Wall Street reward this kind of work? I mean, if if you look at uh, an analyst and they say, well, gee, we see that they're paying this much more in wages at this company, wouldn't that wouldn't yeah, that lead Wall them to question? That's correct. Wall Street, I think, is a big part of the problem. Uh, what some people call the financialization. So, uh, you know, you used to have hotels, for example, owned by a family. So a family might own one hotel or two or three. If it was a luxury hotel and they were charging it $300 a night, you know, they paid their workers fairly. Uh, but today, you pay $300 a night and they pay the woman who cleans your room $7.50 an hour, the same as if it were a Motel 6. Uh, because Wall Street wants to see those profit margins. They don't have the concept that uh, you can't tell everything just in the profit margin. You can have a high profit margin on a low volume, and that is not maximizing profit. You can have a low margin on a high revenue stream, and that will get you a larger profit. Well, I think part of the issue is that paying your workers more has always been kind of looked at as a nice thing to do, perhaps a moral thing to do, but maybe a little bit soft. And if you're a hard-nosed business person, uh, you don't want to get a reputation for being sort of soft on your workers. But that is How the do we change that, that societal response to this? Well, the, 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 I think you're right about that, you know. And uh, in the past, it wasn't uh, much of a problem because if you just go back a couple of decades, 40% of the workforce was unionized. If you go back even to more recent history than that, you had 30% of the workforce unionized. Uh, unions then provided the discipline. So it's really hard. I, I mean, to be, to be fair to companies, it is really hard as a single employer to swim against the tide. But uh, when you have unions and they are negotiating for part of the productivity increase, then unionized companies pay higher wages. And those companies that don't have unions and don't want unions have to match those higher wages if they want to remain without a union. Otherwise, a union can come in and organize their workers. And so this set a floor. This said, OK, the pie is growing. You're entitled to your share. Sure, profits should go up. We're entitled to our share. Wages should also go up. And without that discipline, uh, it is difficult for individual employers to uh, swim against the tide. And I think for that reason, we need to think about public policy. We need to think about changing the incentive structure that faces employers, make it easy, level the playing field for the good employers, and make mm -hmm. it easier for other employers to do the right thing. We're going to stop there for a minute. We'll be right back. The Zicklin School of Business at Brew College of the City University of New York is the largest and most diverse accredited business school in the United States, offering high-quality, full-time and part-time degree programs at the undergraduate, master's and Ph.D. levels. For information about the Zicklin School of Business, please visit our website, zicklin.baruch.cuny.edu. That's zicklin.baruch.cuny.edu. Welcome back. I'm speaking with Eileen Applebaum, management professor at Rutgers University. You mentioned the public policy issues. I think one of the things that's so disturbing is, as you say, you can see an individual company doing something like this, but what's the effect on our economy as a whole when everyone takes this low-wage strategy? Well, uh, we can easily see. You know, we just recently had the uh, new numbers out on what has happened to middle class incomes, actually incomes across the board. But just focusing on middle class incomes, you might be surprised to, to learn that they went down. They went down last year. Uh, they went uh, down by $1,500. Uh, the middle class household income, and many of these households, you know, have more than one earner. Uh, middle class household income in this country is $43,300. Uh, so this is a decline. And if we were back in the good old days when wages rose along with productivity, that middle income household, that household right in the middle of the income distribution, would have a household income of $60,000 and not $43,300. That's right. It's a huge, it's a huge difference. So, so that's the effect on the economy. And there's a, a large percentage of the workforce that is near the poverty level. Huge. So the other, the other thing to say is that the ranks of the working poor are extremely large. When, when we did Low Wage America, we were actually surprised. The, the book did not start out to be Low Wage America. It started out to be a study of industries that hire large numbers of high school graduates. 
what's happening to high school graduates? That was our question. Well, they've joined Low Wage America. <laughs> that was what we discovered, that uh, about uh, a quarter of Americans uh, are making poverty level wages. They are among the working poor. If you look at the new jobs that have been created in this past year, it turns out that more than half of them are in industries that are notorious for the low wages that they pay. So there's no sign that, the, uh, that we're going to shrink the bottom and grow the middle. In fact, the opposite seems to be true. You know, the middle class is shrinking and the bottom uh, is growing. What, what kind of public policy responses could we see to this problem? Well, one of the most important uh, has to do with the minimum wage. It turns out that uh, the minimum wage for many, many years, especially in that period when the middle class was growing, was equal to a half of the average wage. A minimum wage equal to half the average wage really does set a floor under the middle class. Uh, because there are lots of employers who, in order to hire a good employee, will pay a dollar or two above the minimum wage. Well, the minimum wage today is $5.15 an hour. The average wage at this moment is $15.77. So we are at a third. The minimum wage should be a half the average wage, and instead it's only a third of the average wage. The minimum wage should be around $7.80 an hour, not five fifteen. dollars And that would make a huge difference. Would make a huge difference, because think of all those employees who work for employers who, you know, want to hire, they, they don't want to pay the bare minimum. So they're paying you seven or seven fifty dollars an hour. That puts you below the poverty line uh, for if you have a family. Uh, so, you know, if the minimum wage were seven eighty and you were being paid ten dollars an hour, that puts you on the bottom rung of the middle class. That that lets you get through that gateway and start up the ladder into the middle class. It's a huge difference. So one thing is we need to raise the minimum wage to half the average wage, and then we have to peg it to half the average wage. Do you see that happening in terms of the political? Well, I I think it can happen. I think it can happen. Uh, you. Uh, uh, you probably know that Senator Kerry has called for a $7 mm -hmm. an hour uh, minimum wage. But what makes me think it can happen is that many states and localities have not waited for the federal government. They just, it's impossible for people to live on 5 dollars mm -hmm. an hour. And it undermines good employers. It's hard for you to be a good employer if down the street an unscrupulous person can pay 5 dollars an hour to their workers. Well, not even an unscrupulous person, just someone who can get away with it. I think well, we're seeing right. this, I mean, the airline industry is an interesting example right now. You know, we have so many of the airlines struggling, uh, going in and out of bankruptcy, it seems like, almost every day. And they're competing with upstart right. companies who don't have unions, who have a lower cost structure. And I feel like nationally, we're sort of in a race for the bottom. This um, does appear to be what's happening. You know, uh, I think you're absolutely right. We're watching the Walmartization of the airline industry. And sure, everybody likes the everyday low prices. Everybody wants the low uh, airfares. But the other side of it is that people can't live on the wages that they're being paid. And uh, so how do, they, how do they manage to stay together? How do they manage, uh, well, we have a lot of homelessness, but why don't we have even more of it? And the answer is that these workers then are eligible for food stamps. They are al eligible for subsidized housing, Section 8 housing. Uh, they get the earned, if they have children, they get the earned income tax credit. Their children get, uh, you know, uh, public uh, uh, health insurance through the CHIP program. So you pay the low price for your air ticket or you pay the low price for your uh, blouse at uh, Walmart, but then you pay it out in higher taxes. So it's coming out We're of the pockets. We're shifting the cost to the federal government through but these that, programs. But that's us, okay? When you shift the cost to the federal government, that's the middle class who pays the taxes. How big a threat are um, workers who are working in countries where we have no protections like this and where the wage costs are even lower than here? I mean, are we racing to the bottom, not just of this country's economy, but to the bottom of, say, India or... Uh, well, uh, it varies by country, of course, uh, but uh, I think the big problem is when U.S. companies move their own manufacturing to other countries not to serve that domestic market. Because if you're serving that domestic market, you can pay higher, you can have wages rising there, and then people in that country can buy more and you just serve that market. You're happy to see wages rise because then there's a larger market of in consumers. China or Mexico of consumers. The problem is that we've moved a lot of U.S. manufacturing to 
other countries where the only attraction is the low wages and we are producing there to sell back into the U.S. market. This is bad for U.S. workers. They lose good paying jobs. And this is bad for workers in those less developed countries because what their governments are promising are that these workers are going to be low wage workers so that they can attract uh, American manufacturers there. Uh, so this is not a win-win situation for workers. It's a lose-lose situation for workers. Do consumers have any op any opportunity to sort of weigh in, I mean, by not buying at some of these low-cost stores? I mean, does that help at all, the, some of these boycotts that people have called for? Well, I think that consumers can, uh, you know, insist that uh, uh, the companies that they deal with uh, and make sure that local labor laws are enforced, make sure that it's possible for workers in other countries to organize unions. It would be nice if workers in this country could also <laughs> organize unions. I mean, that would be another, that, that is how we solved the problem in the past and we could solve it Well, let, that let's way talk again. about that for a second. I mean, the union representation in the workforce is down to what now? Well, it's under it's, 10 percent uh, in the private sector workforce is under 10 percent and overall is probably about 12 or 13 percent. Do you see any prospect of that number reversing and going back up again? I think that, well, this is a larger question, <laughs> which we might want to talk about sometime. Uh, I think it's possible. It's, it's not going to be your father's union movement. It's going to be something a little bit different. But uh, what I can say for sure is that where there are still strong unions and where you do have high union density, it does still make a difference for workers. So while cleaning people who clean your room in hotels generally are paid six, seven, seven fifty an hour max uh, in San Francisco at those top hotels, uh, all of the top hotels in San Francisco are unionized, so you have high union density. And uh, those uh, housekeepers are paid $14 an hour. Right here in New York City, if you look at nursing assistants, uh, nursing assistants in this country, are it's pitiful. We pay them 7 or seven fifty an hour uh, to take care of our the frail, the elderly, the sick, the most vulnerable members of our population. Uh, and uh, here in New York City, because you have uh, a strong union, unionization, the hospitals are uh, almost all of them, uh, unionized, uh, they were able to negotiate uh, between the hospitals and the union uh, a situation in which they developed training programs for nursing assistants. Those nursing assistants who successfully completed the training programs saw a 20 percent increase in their pay. But of course, those nursing assistants are now better trained and they can take over some of the less skilled jobs that the nurses, the RNs, have been performing uh, and free up. You know, we have a nursing shortage. So let's have the RNs doing the high skill things. Let's have nursing assistants can certainly do more than just bathe patients and change bedpans. Uh, let's have them doing some of the uh, lower level skills. Let's give them the, the appropriate training, of course. Well, when you have a unionized uh, workforce in this way, you have two sides of a table. You can negotiate and you can come out with win-win solutions. Are there things, I mean, going back to the public policy, is there not something that could be done to create some incentives to encourage industries or employers to offer training programs, this kind of thing? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, one of the things that I think needs to be done, and this was very clear coming out of Low Wage America, was not something I knew before we did the research. What we found is that where employers uh, organize themselves into <clears throat> an employer's association that doesn't only lobby, okay, there are a lot of employer's associations, they're mostly about lobbying so that their taxes won't go up or, you know, something like that. But we found, for example, in North Carolina among SOC manufacturers, and we found in other places as well, that the employers had organized themselves into an association and uh, pulled, their, pulled some money and hired uh, professional staff, and here's the kind of things that the professional staff can do for you. One thing that they can do is they can figure out how to access what are called customized training funds. The U.S. Department of Labor makes available training funds to companies on the following basis. You have to agree that after you've trained these workers, there will be higher paying jobs for them to go into. They will have a chance to use those skills, and then the government provides you with funds to train these workers. You have to have, of course, a good program. So generally what happens, what happened in North Carolina, is that this association of employers, no unions involved at all, the association of employers joined together with the local community college, developed a training program. They have immigrant workers, so they, uh, for machine repair, for example, they used a lot more blueprints and a lot less words. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, developed a customized training program, trained immigrant workers to do skilled work, and 
all of this was Thereby paid for by the government. Raising the wages. So there yeah. are other things there that can be done. There are other things that can be done. We've been very fortunate to have Rutgers University manage management professor Eileen Applebaum as our guest today. We'll be right back. Some people think of New York as the world's second home. The City University of New York, with students coming from 90 countries and speaking more than 155 languages, is the world's first university. Find us on the web at cuny.edu or call us at 1-800-CUNY-YES. We live in an age when maximizing shareholder value, translation, doing anything you can to get a company's stock price to rise, is the holy grail of our society. But some economists are now asking whether the aggregate cost cutting that results from that, the inexorable race to the bottom, may actually be harming us in the long run. Already, in a bid to remain competitive, almost a quarter of the American working population is earning less in wages than is necessary to keep them above the poverty line. This hardly seems the measure of a successful economic system. A few companies, such as Costco, have experimented with a different business model. But even though they can demonstrate that treating their employees more generously has led to higher productivity and healthy profits, they have not been rewarded with higher stock prices on Wall Street. Until we can open our minds to the idea that high shareholder returns and higher living standards for workers need not be incompatible, we are at risk of undermining our future. For USA Inc., I'm Sarah Bartlett.